Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, what is it about the road? Is it the thrill of leaving, exodus, escape, or is it the thrill of arriving, destination? Or is it more just about the journey itself, about the process of movement, rather than the point you are coming from or the point you are getting to? So much of significance in our culture derives from the notion of the journey or being on the road, whether it's St. Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus, or Chaucer's tales of pilgrimage to Canterbury, or even Kerouac's discoveries on the road, things happen when we are on the move. My work involves quite a lot of travel in and out of Gibraltar, and I usually fly from Gibraltar Airport, but on occasions I use Malaga Airport. And one early crisp spring morning, uh, as postman Pat would say when the day was barely dawning, <laughs> I was on the road to Malaga. And I was tuned in to one of those Spanish channels that runs those programs on early morning talks uh, in an attempt to sort of fortify us and prepare us for the day ahead, to, make, to lift our spirits. Uh, and one of the panelists on that uh, program was a lady, a grandmother. But this was a sophisticated lady, thoughtful, articulate and sensitive. And she said that in coming to make sense of uh, the day ahead, of the road ahead, she had three insights to life which she thought were vital and which uh, uh, she wanted to share. And these have strangely stayed with me for all this time, for the years since I first heard that. Firstly, she said that in life there are no great revelations. So, essentially, how often have we started reading a book? How often have we planned a holiday? How often have we embarked on some new experience? Uh, thinking, or certainly even hoping, that some life-changing event might occur as a result. And how often can we truly say that we've experienced some sort of great revelation or eureka moment? Please note, she wasn't saying there are no revelations in life. She was saying there are no great revelations in life. She was simply making clear that we shouldn't expect Big Bang events that give meaning or direction to our lives. In other words, what she was telling us, I think, is that what we learn, we have to learn over time in an accumulative, progressive, patient manner. There aren't shortcuts that in an instant reveal some truth or deep understanding. Of course, there may be moments that act as a sort of mental or emotional catalyst. That can happen. But these moments are not revelatory in the full sense of the word. I mean, for example, whatever the true accuracy of Newton's story with the apple, it's much more likely that he discovered gravity over a process of time, conceived over a process of time, than rather as a result of a single event. And I personally find it hard to believe that St. Paul was converted miraculously to Christianity in a flash on the road to, Damas to Damascus. Surely that moment will have been preceded by a much slower and a more contemplative process of reflection. The reality is that truth, insights, knowledge, is revealed in little bits in our daily lives all the time. Therefore, let's not expect to be dazzled or arrested by some momentous experience of events that are most unlikely to, event to occur. Even those experiences that, as I said before, appear revelatory, are in fact confirmatory. Such experiences often affirm some knowledge or some insight that you're already working towards. It's simply the last step in a process. The phrase, when the penny drops, is quite instructive in this respect. When an idea finally takes shape in our minds, we say the penny has dropped. We don't say that a 10 pence penny has dropped, or a 50 pence penny has dropped, or a pound penny, a pound uh, a, a coin has dropped. We say a single penny has dropped, the smallest unit of currency. And why? 
because it only takes a little push, it only takes a little more to confirm and make sense of knowledge that we are required to accumulate painstakingly over time. So what I think she was saying, and what I'm trying to say in many more words, is that we have to have the humility to accept that the road to knowledge is tough. There'll be signposts along the way, but very rarely are there shortcuts. This brings me to the second thought that she wanted to share with us. And this is that nothing that we achieve in life is of any value except what we do through work. Nothing is going to make us happy or contented or satisfied or fulfilled unless we achieve that through work. Put simply, we cannot expect to take more than we contribute. It won't be of value to us and it won't be of value to society. This has profound personal and collective consequences. Whether we teach, whether we serve, whether we sing, whether we dance, whether we house parent, whether we even debate in parliament, we create. But the reverse, which is inactivity, disengagement, sloth, is destructive. If we agree that everything we consume or anything we consume or take gratuitously has no real value, that should define the way we relate to each other and what we expect from each other. But I wonder sometimes whether our celebrity, our cut and paste, and our protected cradle to grave society has made us lose our belief in the value of work. Einstein once declared that genius is 1%, talent, 99% effort. And Pope Francis recently said, we do not get dignity from power or money or culture, we get dignity from work. The Greeks are going to the polls tomorrow in an election that could see a populist left party elected and might create a wave across Europe that would change the landscape of the political uh, position in Europe. But of course, in Europe, we have a deep crisis. As at July 2014, there were over 5 million young people unemployed, that is under the age of 25. This is a staggering 22% of all young people, more than twice the EU unemployment rate. Unfortunately, Spain, our neighbor, has the highest rate at 53.8%, one of every two persons. And Greece follows shortly at 53.1%. This is not just an economic crisis, it's an affront to the worth and dignity of an entire generation. So this lady was making two very deep and far-reaching comments when it comes to work. That as individuals, whether it's in our relationships, in how we earn our living, it's only going to be through work that we're going to find anything of satisfaction. Anything that comes to us free is disingenuous and not worthy. But secondly, that society must do everything possible to create the conditions to make work possible and to give that dignity that comes from it. Her third observation was we must never forget to relish the small things in life, the small things and the small moments in life. I was in Paris about this time last year, and I was at the rooftop of one of those lovely restaurants in one of the museums, uh, and sitting with my wife, and sitting beside us was a couple, a young couple, and although we don't normally eavesdrop or indeed spy on other people, we couldn't help noticing that these two young people, a gorgeous couple, good-looking and well-off and clearly bright-eyed bright and intelligent, were glued to their iPhones, Oblivious, it seemed to us, to their setting, oblivious to the food, oblivious to each other. Have we lost the capacity to relish simple individual pleasures? Are we simply too stressed, too engaged, too distracted? Part of the reason might simply be the bombardment, the surfeit of information, usually unsolicited information, that comes our way. This week's G uh, GBC Viewpoint talked about the negative impact of social media. I was struck how even those who are participants that are in social media so immediately and quickly recognize the very negative impact of social media. True, there are great, enormous benefits to this, but have we gone too far? Have we become slaves too, rather than masters of this technology? But another equally compelling reason that might explain why we have lost the sensitivity to understand uh, uh, small things or appreciate small things is just excess, the excess that comes from wealth. 
frankly, Spanish from Palmer Ham at Christmas is just no, no, good as, as, no, is no longer as good as it used to be. You know, we have it too often and it's too easy. Familiarity does breed contempt. A 2010 study undertaken by a group of leading universities, uh, among which are UCL and the University of British Columbia, actually tells us what we already intuitively know. In a paper entitled, The Money Giveth and Money Taketh Away, the authors contend that the wealthier we become, the more blunted we are in our ability to appreciate small pleasures. The investigation looked at a number of small individual tests, like the ability to actually appreciate chocolate. Fascinating that the wealthier you are, even the mere thought of wealth makes you less able to appreciate those simple flavors, those simple pleasures. Perhaps it's just another example of the so-called affluenza syndrome, that uh, effect that affluence seems to have on society that decreases rather than increases contentment. But the other aspect of relishing, I think, uh, invites us to look at reality. It asks us to consider the nature of reality, because we can only relish through our senses, through our eyesight, through our hearing, through our sight, through, through our uh, touch, through our smell. By definition, we can only relish things in the present. We only live in the present. For, of course, we have to have regard to the past, and of course we have to look towards the future, but it's only in the present that anything will ever happen. It's rather like John Lennon's life is what's happening to you or happens to you whilst you're busy making other plans. And of course, that is part of a long intellectual tradition. But the long and short of it all is that we're often too shackled by the past or too prepared to compromise the present in the forlorn hope that there is a different, perhaps better tomorrow. But to live in the reflected glory of yesterday, which is nostalgia, or the promised land of tomorrow, is frankly delusional. If we can make any difference, we should do so now. If there is anything we want to savor, we should savor now. If there's anything that we think we can contribute, we should contribute now. Because to leave it for tomorrow is by definition to leave it to a time that will never arrive. So we return via our long and winding road back to where we belong, but only for a short while, I would suggest, because soon we'll be on the move again, soon we'll feel restless, soon we'll be journeying, soon we'll be expectant. Thank you.